So when everyone is done, let me know and we can uh, keep going. I'll try to identify whatever it is. Okay. Steve's going to be here. No. No. I'm in the town and change. No. 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 Are you ready? Yeah. I am. Barbara. Okay. Uh, call this meeting to order, Cape Elizabeth Planning Board. First order of business. Uh, let me just go through the agenda tonight. First, uh, we will review the minutes and approve them. We will list and identify correspondence we've received. Then under old business, First item is the Hamlin Street Resource Protection Permit. Uh, second item under old business is Leighton Farm Subdivision, Request for Preliminary Subdivision Review and Resource Protection Permit. And then uh, for new business is the Pillsbury Private Access Way Permit. Uh, everyone has received a copy of the minutes for the February 18th, 2003 Planning board meeting. Are there any changes? We have a motion. A motion to approve the minutes from the last meeting. Motion to approve the minutes has been made. Do we have a second? Mr. Chairman, I second the motion. Motion's been made and second. All in favor? Okay, none opposed. The minutes are approved. Uh, I would like to identify correspondence that we have received, and that includes a memorandum from Mr. and Mrs. Nedwell, Rehamlin Street, letter dated February 19, 2003, from Mr. and Mrs. Nedwell, Rehamlin Street, letter dated February 21, 2003, from Mr. and Mrs. Nedwell, Rehamlin Street, email from D. Hinman, Rehamlin Street. A letter from K. Howe, Relayton Farms. Planning board comments regarding the town center lot. A letter from R. Howe, Relayton Farms. A letter from P. Jordan, Relayton Farms. A letter from K. Allen, Reaffordable Housing. A copy of the February 2003 zoning news. Uh, a letter dated November 5th. 2002 from Russell Tornrose and Holly Clark regarding Hamlin Street. A letter dated March 14th, 2003 from Russell Tornrose regarding Hamlin Street. A letter dated March 10th, 2003 from David and Robin Clay regarding Late Farms. 
a notice of intent to file of Wiley Enterprises for stormwater management permit. Uh, I don't see a date. And a memo from the Cape Elizabeth Public Works Department uh, dated March 11th, 2003 regarding Pillsbury private access. I think that covers the correspondence. We also received this evening a copy of a folder from Mr. and Mrs. Nedwell regarding Hamlin Street containing correspondence, uh, photographs, and copies of uh, a magazine article uh, and also some additional original photographs with notations. Uh, for the members of the board, we there's one copy of this, so I will try to pass it so everyone can look at it. Uh, hopefully we can do that while we're uh, while we're going through the issues. Uh, I want to pass it down to the end. Okay, on the uh, Hamlin Street request for resource protection permit to widen Hamlin Street uh, and construct culvert improvements RP2 wetland. Um, the application was deemed complete at the February meeting. Uh, tonight we will have a public hearing. Prior to that, uh, we'd like to have the applicant uh, come up and summarize, if they could, changes made to the plans. Mr. Moore. Thank you. Good evening, board members. Uh, Stephen Moore, born in Sheridan Landscape Architects. Forgive my scratchy throat. I'm recovering from the cold. Um, as the chair has mentioned, what I'd like to do is just touch on the revisions and changes in the submissions since the last time. Um, the board saw this application at the previous meeting in which I'm going to turn this sideways in the hope that the, all of the board can then see that. Uh, Hamlin Street's at the top. Uh, Ned Wells is to the south, or to the, to the bottom. Um, north is towards me. The couple of key things that were addressed in this resubmission that came to you uh, early this month are as follows. Steve Harding had raised a question about making sure that the swale on the east side of the house was well defined enough so that the water running from this area of the property would in fact be assured to get down into here and not pass onto here. That was done and, and noted on the plans. In addition, Mr. Harding raised several technical questions about Toa Slope and edge of fill and riprap, which were then um, duly noted on the plan. The piece that's in question for the wetland permit is the part that's highlighted here, which is the extension of uh, the culvert itself and then the associated fill to get that road uh, widened out. The couple of other pieces that we touched on in the additional submission were, there were questions from the board about tree locations. We put the taped tree locations um, on this drawing to indicate where we feel located them using a tape. That's different than the instrument survey that located all the previous information that was shown in the original base plans. So what I'm saying is the tree locations do have, in fact, uh, the ability to have to actually measure them. They might be off by a couple of feet one way or the other, but we know we have them generally in those right locations. On the plan submission, we did show you trees to remain, trees to be cut, and that's what's depicted here. Uh, the last thing we did, one of the board members had requested that we submit what we had roughed out for calculations for the impervious change and runoff. Uh, we did that. We did formalize it and put it under an engineer's stamp after I had discussed this matter with Steve Harding and told him we'd be submitting it. He requested that we make it a little more formal than just our calculations. What those calculations showed was that right now what's happening in this uh, hydrology of this stream 
is this 18-inch culvert is really acting like a throttle on the larger 42-acre watershed that's above this. The, um, this to the west that includes the Maxwell Pond and the abutting homes. That 18-inch culvert surcharges and backs water up into this pond that's right here. So the maximum flow that can come through there is 17.5 CFS, cubic feet per second. When we actually ran the calculations on this lot, um, what you see in there is that increase um, was 0 0.02 or 0 .0, 0 0.02 percent, um, or about a third of the CFS um, difference in terms of pre and post development. What that means is um, right now that property is shedding a certain amount of water. After we build this, put the roofs on, put the driveways on, porches on, change some of that groundwater topography, um, what we get, or rather the sheet water topography, is that we get that slight increase. The important point here, though, that's spelled out in Mr. Walsh's memo is that that increase exits this site and passes downstream prior to the larger peak coming from that upstream watershed. Um, the significance here is you don't want to have peaks and peaks coinciding because it compounds flooding. We just documented that, um, again, to show the board that, in fact, after construction, this will not have um, an impact in terms of that runoff and change in flooding uh, potential downstream. Um, uh, the only thing to touch on is just the fact that I know there's a tremendous amount of correspondence, and I just want to highlight the fact that, in fact, we're showing that silt fence we have this undisturbed buffer that we're leaving uh, around that stream, unlike the character of some of the adjoining properties up and down this uh, stream corridor. And we're confident that this can be constructed and built um, the way we're showing it. The purpose of going through that kind of detailed plan with the house was to give the board a level of comfort that we could in fact meet um, the standards of that zone and not have to have an RP2 zone um, permit request or RP2 request for any wetland alteration around that stream, and that the limit of our request is really focused on um, that culvert itself. With that, I'll turn it back to the board for any additional questions. Anyone have any questions before we open the public hearing? Mr. Charles. You just made a comment about maintaining that buffer around the stream unlike other properties. Could you clarify that? Um, the buffer that's been maintained, the stream center line is here and the DEP measures the setback off the stream, not the wetland. Mm -hmm. We've maintained that natural area um, in varying widths. At this point, it's its narrowest, um, about 9 or 10 feet of upland, maintaining its current condition down into the wetland, into the stream. When you look at the fill slopes that are associated with this house and where they fill that into the pond, and the field slopes associated with this house where they filled out right to the stream bank, um, there is not a buffer of natural undisturbed soil of this sort of magnitude or width on the upstream and downstream property. Okay. Could you identify the, those properties by the name of the owner? I'm just trying to, think. I've got all these photographs, and I'm trying to put them into context. Um, this one I'm sure of is Nedwell. I apologize for not, isn't this lot 54? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Do you anticipate having to blast at all to build this house? And if you do have to blast, is that going to affect the wetland? Um, I'm going to let Joe, we've, we've only looked marginally at the soils in the terms of that depth. I believe that there will be some little bit of ledge removal up in the center. Is that consistent with what you've done for investigation? Of Today was all the snow, it's a tough question. I did look at the lot uh, once more today to see how much ledge is affected or would be affected. Right now, currently, I don't believe, I don't plan to do any blasting. I'm hoping that the uh, design of the house will lend itself to the, the fact that I won't have to blast. It's not my intention, it's not my desire to blast. I'm hoping that uh, with the design of the house, garage on the uh, front right hand side and the lower side would be a daylight basement and the back portion would be daylight that uh, will minimize or eliminate blasting completely. So it's, it's our intention right now not to blast.
Any other questions? Okay, I'm sure we'll have some more uh, after the hearing. At this point, I'd like to open a uh, public hearing and invite members of the public to speak uh, on this application. Please, uh, whoever speaks, please first identify yourself and tell us where you live. Uh, that's helpful. All right. My name is Darlene Netwell. I live at 3 South Street. I'm the easterly abutting neighbor. Thank you for holding this public hearing regarding the proposed development of Lot 50 on Hamlin Street. We come as homeowners to oppose any change to this wetland area. Mr. Fuscashi's plans are misleading. Distances to neighboring homes are not to scale. Our house is here, it is 20 feet off the rear. The Lyman's house is here, it's approximately eight to 10 feet off the side here. The proposed home site is uncomfortably close to our house and to that of Dave Lyman. Mr. Fuscashi wants to put the house's driveway up along the Lyman's property line. Where is the plowed snow to go in the winter time? Plowing in the opposite direction is going to create a frozen dam in windy flooding uplands and over the Hamlin Street. Mr. Fristashi's plans also depict trees being saved where there are no trees, as shown by our photos. The home's construction would require the removal of at least 23 mature trees, which average 50 to 60 feet tall. The few remaining trees would sustain such a shock to their root system by digging and blasting in such close proximity that they die within a year or two. These here, there's no way that they'd make it through construction. The land is used as a breeding ground for the American black ducks, which are in decline. They come each spring with their ducklings. Altering the wetlands would certainly stop these visits. The wetlands are an important part of the ecological chain in our area not a recirculating water feature that Mr. Pristachi's engineer, Stephen Harding, proposes putting a footbridge over. The lot does not contain adequate buildable land for a dwelling. There is inadequate road access because the stream and wetlands bisect the lot diagonally. Being wetlands, we see a lot of flooding, especially in the springtime. Construction on lot 50 would compound the risk of flooding, especially, excuse me, both up and down streams. The removal of trees and vegetation and the addition of so much impervious surfaces will certainly mean greater watershed into the stream and onto our property. That Mr. Fristachi's engineer says otherwise is unbelievable to me. Who is going to ensure that future homeowners will respect the restrictions that living next to wetlands require? What if they want to landscape or fertilize with chemicals or salt their driveway in the winter? Who's going to stop them? Please stop them today. Say no to developing Lot 50. One more house for sale in case isn't worth damaging protected wetlands in neighboring homes. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Philip Nedwell. I live at 3 South Street, Cape Elizabeth. I am a builder. The lot that Joseph Pistachi wants to build on is of great concern to me. It poses many problems with wetlands in the neighborhood. I have made a detailed map to actual scale. The map shows the staked out house and the wetlands. Mr. Pistachi has submitted conflicting drawings to actual land and size of wetlands. The setbacks on the house do not cons Excuse me. The setbacks on the house are not consistent with the plans. The house does not meet code enforcement setbacks, nor does it meet DEP setbacks from the wetlands. The lot is bisected diagonally from which the water flows from the far north side of the, of the protected wetlands. Three trees that are said that would be saved would not be. The root system is very shallow due to the ledge underneath. The roots spread close to the surface. Digging within 15 feet of these trees would kill them. A corner of my house sits on the ledge that goes up to lot 50. There is a dramatic slope from lot 50 down to my house. The canopy of 23 mature trees and the, uh, the moss are, excuse me, 
If the canopy of 23 mature trees and the moss are removed, it will cause my land and house to be flooded. If a canopy of 23 mature trees and moss are removed, it would cause the flooding to my house. The asphalt from the roof and the driveway, not to mention the loom that will replace the trees and moss, will cause great amount of watershed which will flood my land and cellar. The studies have not been carefully calculated. A five minute drive by or an office study is not sufficient when dealing with the amount of water in this wetlands in this area. The impact to the neighboring houses and to the removal, excuse me, to the impact of the neighboring houses in dealing with the amount of water in the wetlands in this area. The impact to houses and the wetlands will be severe. We ask that the request to waiver a stormwater calculations be denied. The removal of more than 25 large trees will have a negative impact to wildlife. This wetland area serves as a connector to the wetland area across the street, which is South Street, and to the three ponds upland by Maxwell Farms residents. To put footings and underground services such as public sewer, electricity, and water lines are going to require blasting to the road. The proposed house would be on Blue Ledge. I built both of the two houses, the Thorn Roses and my own house. Um, <clears throat> this would require blasting on Blue Ledge. Blue Ledge is extremely hard and would require blasting. Blasting will cause extensive damage to my house and probably level David Lyman's house, which is about 10 feet from where they plan on building. To attempt to construct a house would mean disturbing an area of approximately 25 feet around the house. This is standard in home construction. Mr. Fustacci thinks he can build a house by maintaining a 1 to 5 foot buffer on the northern side and a 10 foot buffer on the southern easterly sides. This is completely unrealistic expectations, as anyone driving by a construction site can attest to. There is no room for a lot, there is no room on the lot or on Hamlin Street for numerous contractors to drop their building materials or to park their vehicles. There are so many reasons why building on lot 50 would be a grave mistake to the wetlands and to the neighboring homes. The only reason why Mr. Fustacci wants to build on it is because he acquired the land free with the purchase of three Stevenson Street home. Please don't allow Mr. Fustacci's greed to overshadow the need to protect wetlands and neighboring homes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, my name is Holly Clark Tornrose, and I live in the, this house. Um, in addition to the concerns that have been shared by the Nedwells and the concerns that Russell will share tonight, I have additional concerns to share this evening with the board. Over the last several months since the property across the street has changed ownership, I have witnessed several behaviors which demonstrate that the builder has little concern for the neighborhood in which he hopes to build. Earlier this fall, the builder undertook a renovation project on the existing house on the lot adjacent to lot 50. Be in this house. He burned materials in the backyard, materials that could have been easily transported to our transfer station for a small <coughs> fee. This burning was both environmentally unsound and this, this, it smelled up the neighborhood for several days. Um, I think it was inconsiderate to do that. I know that he did obtain a, a fire permit for at least for one of the days that he was burning for several days and I was not close, but I think some of the things he was burning were not things that are typically covered by um, a permit like linoleum or other kind of building materials. Um, after the renovation project was completed, he covered the charred remains with dirt in the backyard. Within a short time of obtaining the property, a tree was felled in lot 50. And you can actually just see the tip of that tree. It's crossing the, um, well, you can see the, there's a clothesline, that, that black spot in the middle, that's the tip of the tree. Um, the fallen tree lay across the backyard of the adjacent lot, also owned by the builder, and cut through a clothesline set up in the backyard. This tree, felled tree has been left there for months and is now covered with snow. Um, this photo was taken this morning, actually, before I left for work. Um, also, the trees that were mentioned, um, just to respond to um, the change in the plans, as of this morning, they were also not clearly taped or marked. And I think I was here at the last uh, meeting, and I believe that was one of the requests of the board was to have that clearly labeled. And I don't think um, 
labeling them the day of, it's possible that that's been taken care of, but I don't think labeling it the day of is the kind of consideration that the board was asking and requesting from the builder to show the neighborhood what his intentions were. In addition, um, we have all witnessed the significant amount of snowfall we've gotten this winter. The porch of the house, Rush, could you put the porch of the house um, for sale next door has been mounting with snow. And to the point, and you all know that snow gets very heavy when it's in large volumes, the um, porch has actually been um, broken off the house, which has basically caused basically an eyesore to anyone living in the neighborhood. And another concern I have is about the road. Um, this is the road, and you can just see the culvert, which is slightly green, um, and then the tire tracks are in the road with some um, water in them. And my concern in terms of the utilities, part of his hope with extending the request for the, the culvert is to um, work with the utilities somehow either under or above that culvert. I'm not exactly sure of the technicalities on that. Um, but it's my concern that if he has to put the utilities somehow around that culvert, that the road will need to be built up. And for that, that might cause a different kind of grading and water may um, run back into our property. And again, it's one of those things that Phil mentioned. Um, it's hard to picture this all in your mind, and these are the things that I would hope um, perhaps another visit and with these points in mind um, might shed some light, because it is hard to conceptualize something just from photos or from some um, different drawings that we have. So to close, in just a few short months, this builder has managed to openly burn refuse material, fell a tree and leave it for months to decompose, and has taken what a pleasant, was a pleasant home and neglected it during his time of ownership. These events have left the impression that he has little environmental or personal concern for where we live. In addition, the approach taken makes me wonder, if he should gain ability to build on this wetland, will he carelessly regard the parameters set up to protect the wetland? And should he run into difficulty with ledge or blasting and flooding, will he neglect the project as he's done on the adjacent property and leave us with a plot stripped of trees, a road torn up, and a dent in what was a, once was a wooded area of our neighborhood? Thank you for considering these additional concerns. Thank you. Seven Hamlin Street. You might say I'm the last kid on the block. And uh, that picture right there. The gentleman said he wants to extend that eight more feet. If he puts it out eight feet, he's going to be laying his the culvert and filling in over my water pipe, which is not Portland Water District. It, hooks on to Portland Water District. It's our own. We have to maintain it and replace it if it's damaged. Plus the fact, when we do have, uh, in the spring, the water will be up to the edge of the road. At the present time, that culvert, that size culvert, is a 19-inch, almost 20-inch culvert. And it has done a good job, but in a few, there's been two or three times that the road went. Now, if he extends that and interrupts the flow of that road, I will be flooded on the back end, as it is in the spring or in a wet fall when that does fill up. My back back of my, the water is almost up to the back of my house. So those are my concerns. Thank you. My name is Constance Babcock, and I live at 6 Stevenson Street, which is around the corner and down the hill from the Hamlin Street lot that we're talking about. My concern is a larger one than the individual ones that have been expressed, and it relates to water in the entire neighborhood. 
I've lived uh, at 6 Stevenson Street for over 33 years. And in that time, I've seen just about everything water can do in that neighborhood. There's a high water table, and there's a lot of wetland, crisscrossed with streams and brooks. And pretty much whatever anyone has done in those years to alter the course of that water has eventually created a problem for someone else. I'll give you a few examples. Years ago, a neighbor at the top of Stevenson Street decided to remove a culvert uh, adjacent to his property, which was inconvenient for him, and he filled it in and planted a willow tree and said that would take care of it. Well, the water dispersed underground, and in time it undermined two driveways further down the street to the point where paving had to be taken up and replaced with crushed rock. That was the only way to get the water to run off. My original next door neighbor had a sump pump that ran year round. And as the water came out of his house, he directed it in such a way that it ran off harmlessly into the woods. Eventually, he sold the house. The new owner no longer had a sump pump. I have no idea what he did with the water, but I've got now a large area of my backyard that's wet nearly all year round. Mr. Nedwell built a personal residence um, down on South Street a few years ago, and then he built a house on Hamlin Street. I would have guessed those lots weren't buildable until he, in fact, built on them. But last summer, a bunch of trees had to be taken up because their root system had been undermined by whatever went on in the process of constructing those houses. And last fall, Mr. Prestacci um, raided Stevenson Street in front of the house that he bought at number five. Part of that process, he filled in a ditch uh, and incorporated it into the road. He did not feel that the ditch was serving any useful purpose. It was built years ago uh, as part of the road work in conjunction with public sewers being extended to that street. Now, we haven't had heavy rainfall, and we've really just begun the spring runoff. Remains to be seen if that's going to be a good idea or not. I don't side with any of the parties in this matter. My concerns with the flow of water in the area. The Hamlin Street lot, I walk by it every day walking my dog, um, where the proposed driveway would be built, and of course the house which will follow. It's a very small lot. It sits on a hillside that's covered with trees, and the hillside slopes down toward a brook. The house would be astoundingly close to its neighbors. And the removal of the trees, uh, which the building would necessitate, can't help but create more water. I don't know what would happen with snow that would be plowed. I would assume there would be runoff from that down into existing waterways. So my request to the members of the planning board is, if you haven't taken a real good look at the site, come out and look at it before you make a decision. Take, walk around, take a look at the, uh, it's beginning to be the height of mud season. Take a look at the amount of water in that neighborhood and understand, as I'm sure you do, that a two-dimensional plan does not really do justice to our concerns. Thank you. Thank you. My name's Russell Tornaros. I live at uh, 5 Hammond Street. Uh, and um, you have a letter from me that I wrote way back uh, November 5th. I can remember when this first came up and um, realized that there was a proposed construction. And I, I called the uh, town planner, Maureen Merritt, and uh, you know, said that I had some concerns and that I would like to, at that time, I wasn't opposed and, to the project at all. I'm not. My brother's an engineer and builder, and um, I you know, encourage development. But I did have some concerns knowing, knowing the property as I do know it and felt that there ought to be some good dialogue over issues of water runoff, the wildlife that I've been observing for a year, and other characteristics of this particular site. And she informed me that you would get my letter. I'm not sure if you did or not back in November. Possibly did, but it wasn't in the, in the record, I know that. So I wrote another letter, and I think I believe called once when you had another, another meeting on that. So, I believe in the deliberative process. I believe the good decisions are made when you hear different people's truths from different uh, points of view. Certainly when you have a builder, he's got one, one perspective. But when you have people that are living very intimately with an area, you get other perspectives. And, um, you know, I, 
to, to, to be able to do the kind of uh, work that you do, I think you need as much uh, information as possible from, di from different points of view. I think it's possible that whenever you look at this, to be able to look at it in a kind of um, mapped area down from the top that looks like a very reasonable proposal. And I'm sure that the builder and his landscape architect probably can answer each of the concerns tonight. Um, but I hope that what you can do is to take and think about your decision from a little different perspective. Um, on the one hand, this seems to be a very narrow decision that you need to make. You're about a resource protection limit. You're talking about extending the culvert, as I understand it, and, and widening that road. And that if you look at the standards and you, if you look at the requirements for that per permit, it appears that, or from the information that I've read, that you felt that Mr. Prostacci's um, package has satisfied that, uh, that he has put in all of the uh, information that is required by law. And I think that's a conclusion that I do contend with. Um, I am concerned about the idealized representation on the map of the site. It's my understanding one of the requirements for the submission of a map, site map, on wetland area is that within 300 feet you need a map that is drawn completely to scale. Could you back up the trees? Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, what happens here is that th this looks fairly reasonable. You look down on it, the scale is certainly within this area here, but if you go and you look at the other structures which are supposed to be included on that, they're completely out of scale, over double scale. This looks like a very reasonable thing. If you take uh, the Lyman House here, you probably, if that were drawn to scale, you probably would not even be able to see the distance between the house and, and the um, uh, stone wall there. So I'm, I'm concerned that the information that you've gotten, uh, both with runoff, some of the uh, ecology things that I have read, are very idealized and have not really taken a good careful study of this area. There seems to be an assumption in everything that I have read is that all of these things, for instance, why would someone who uh, has even su suspects that there might be ledge in a construction site request a waiver for a soils test to go down and to find out what is actually there? That makes no sense to me. Why would someone who is dealing with a, um, a very strong wet area uh, request a, a waiver on, on a runoff pattern? The rationale that's been given is that this is a small area and that all the impact is negligible. And that is kind of the rationale throughout. And that might work if you keep your mind fixed within that little 100 by 100 square. But we're not talking about this. This is a piece of land that is very intimately connected with a lot of other things and there's a lot happening in this particular 100 by 100 area. Um, the impact is an assumption because this is small, there is not much of an impact on the ecological balance and that in fact um, any changes on, on water runoff and uh, soil composition is negligible. I think that is faulty logic to assume that all properties of the same size would, would sort of follow that logic is, is faulty. This particular piece of land is in a unique position to the surrounding area. It needs to be studied specifically as a piece of land, not one person looking at it, counting a few trees, and then deciding that they are able to write up a botanical report on that. It needs to be studied over time. We live near this property. We live very intimately and we watch it and we are well aware of the wildlife and the ever-changing uh, vegetation uh, um, growth that is going on there. We know the volatile nature of the water runoff. You've heard about that tonight. It's very unique. This is not something that you can describe with a so-called rational method where you determine water runoffs by standardized textbook coefficients. You need to watch this property and you need to see how the water behaves within it. This property is part of a fragile and a very compromised yet coexisting life system that should be protected. It's not like any other 100 by 100 lot. Now, why do I believe this? Well, if you have spent some time with the area, you realize that there's a whole corridor that exists here. Beyond up here, beyond our house, it begins up with Maxwell's Pond, which is a fairly large pond, which it is the habitat for a lot of duck and wildlife area. 
The water runs out of that pond and goes into a marsh area where there are a lot of cat and nine tails. And that's a very absorbent area, very soggy all the time, and sometimes during the winter, as I understand, becomes almost like a lake. Then moves down into a small pond beside our house, which comes up to the culvert, and it stands there. And within that small pond, actually, for wildlife, there are mallards that tend to um, nest up on Maxwell's pond. On our pond, we have some American black ducks that, that like to have a more private spot uh, than mallards. And they nest there. Then what happens is that once this water shoots through this culvert, and I think it was mentioned by the architect, it, it, like it changes. And it goes back to, if you know your geology from sort of old standing water, to a rapidly moving stream. Now if you know your streams, you know that streams do not keep the same banks. They tend to move. They stink. If you took a time-lapse photograph of a stream, it would not stay in this area. And I'm not sure when this wetland was determined but my guess is that as that stream has moved, it, it, it has changed. So, and then it moves from here, goes back into brush, and then comes back out into the marshland area. Now what this is, is sort of a long, narrow um, habitat for wildlife. I don't know why it exists. There are houses on, on, on both sides, but I have seen ducks that have moved the entire area. And back and forth, I have seen other wildlife that has moved. It comes out to a marshland well below where we've seen um, not only fox, we've, we've seen um, storks, not storks, but the cranes that have existed there. And, believe it or not, the wildlife move up and down that corridor from Maxwell's Pond down to the marsh area. So, <clears throat> they follow that waterway. It's narrow, but somehow it works. If you construct on this lot, on lot 50, that will cut that corridor, that will cut it off. The removal of cover from that lot, lot, this lot here, will end the nesting that goes on on the lot across the street. I am certain of that. One cannot look at lot 50 in just isolation. It's right in the center of this stream that connects two very fragile um, ecological systems. Anyone who watches that, I'm not sure about there's also supposed to be a, a study of, of vegetation. I have not seen it. I'm not, I have, know that there are very fragile shade and, and fern uh, plants that are growing on both pieces of property. If in fact this construction takes place, that cover, this will go from a shaded area to a full sun area. And you're going to see a, a very, very... Uh, over a period of a year, you're going to see very different vegetation. The vegetation that is there will die out in the wetland area, and then uh, other vegetation will take its place. So I'm not sure how someone can make the kinds of judgments about there being no impact on vegetation, wildlife, or runoff simply by looking at this particular area. You need to study it over time and watch it over time. Um, and another, so far as these trees go, um, this point does actually anger me. I believe and I do not understand where these trees are. I would like to walk with the um, landscape architect and hug each one of them, the ones that are going to remain. If you look at his drawing, it looks like a lot of them are being saved. My feeling is that, and I believe the board needs to understand, that if this proposed construction goes through, every tree on that lot will die. It, it's going to be dead. You cannot, on a shallow soil, ledge lot, get that close to those trees without destroying their root system. They will die. That's simple. I don't think that there's anyone who is, uh, knows the nature of trees or construction that would um, not realize that that's a very, very real possibility. So, <clears throat> the other issue is the watershed area. Uh, the watershed in this area is volatile. The pictures that we have shown you have occurred in a drought year, and I am very, very concerned for the people around us, my neighbors and myself, about increasing that, that runoff. The water that we have looked at, uh, both for the culvert, this has been a drought year. Um, when we put this in here, there'll be all roof and asphalt and just grass area. And everything around, from this property to this property, to the hill area, all of it V's into the stream.
So with all due respect to both the professionals who prepared the information for consideration, I really don't believe that you have the data about this particular lot. I think you have kind of standardized information about 100 by 100 lots, and I think you have information about runoffs. I don't believe that the studies have been done here. Perhaps in 95% of the 100 by 100 lots on which buildings are placed, it would be appropriate to waive the full studies that I propose. There isn't any question from what I have heard about the composition uh, of that there's going to be blasting along this road and that there will be blasting that will happen if you're going to put any kind of a level surface. If you look at the slope on this, in order to get a flat house on there, you're either going to have to put it way up in the air on stilts or you're going to have to cut into ledge. If you start blasting in that area, my guess is that, that um, Mr. Lyman's house will come down. I do not believe that this project rises to the standards for acceptance. First standard for acceptance for this permit, that it will not materially obstruct the flow of, sur of surface or subsurface waters. I think that the flow of waters are going to be greatly changed in this area, and I don't think you can predict exactly what is going to happen. This is not just drainage. This is a major conduit for water that's coming from all over the area. The town engineer talks about the water from upland being 15 minutes behind the water from this particular lot going out, so it won't cause a problem. Now, when I took geology in college, that makes no sense. Water is like electricity. It's, it, it, it moves, and when you get a surge, it shorts out at the weakest point. And this is a convergent point for the energy of all the water in this area. Anyone who looks at the area and really knows their hydrology will be, would be able to recognize that. So I think it's very dangerous to say that there's not going to be any impact. The second assumption behind that is that the water upland is 15 minutes behind the water within this, is that the event stops. Well, what happens when you have several days of rain? Water does not wait and get in line. The, I, I do not understand the kind of reasoning that, in fact, again, it's, it's a question of simply looking at what might happen within the narrow confines of this lot. Second one, um, about water. The third standard for accepting this is that it will not result in significant damage or habitat for aquatic life. That was all that was listed on the application. However, the law says birds or other wildlife. It is clear that wildlife will be impacted. It is clear that nesting, in my opinion, will, will stop. It is clear that that corridor will be cut off. Will not pose problems related to the support of structures. I don't see how this construction can take place without causing a problem for the structure here. I'm also worried about the structure of the road. What happens when we widen this and the pond on the other side? What's going to protect that from material running off? What's going to happen as we blast with ledge to move in sewer pipes underneath? Will not be detrimental to aquifer recharge? It seems to me that when you take this tree cover, and this tree cover is like an umbrella, and you replace that with asphalt and, and a tar roof and lawn in this area, you are going to affect that uh, re recharge. The, the uh, groundwater is going to change. We'll maintain and improve ecological and aesthetic values. I think that, that clearly does not meet the standard. And we've seen already that my concern is that the builder um, is not that concerned with the aesthetic values. And I'm not so sure by, by, by doing burning to save a, a tipping fee is really concerned about ecological values. We'll maintain an adequate buffer between the wetland and the adjacent land uses. Um, I'm not sure about that either. I do not believe that this misguided construction proposal meets the standards for acceptance. I believe that any reasonable person, if you really look and study the area, realize that it will harm the sustenance of wildlife who are using that wilderness corridor. I believe that it will threaten, a reasonable person would understand that it might threaten the structural integrity of the Lyman home if blasting is needed, and also that the, the, um, the putting in of another uh, conduit there I believe that it will dramatically alter the vegetative ecology because the removal and the death of the, of the trees on that lot will move this whole area from a shade environment to a full sun environment. 
So we're not here to take away the livelihood of the builder. We're not here because it's a question of we don't want this in our backyard. We're here because we believe these issues are real. We believe they need to be thought about and they can't be taken out of a textbook by some standard method about runoff. This is a particularly unique ecological area. So I hope that you will take your thinking and move it out of the framework of that specific thing because your decision is, is going to have some far-reaching effects for the areas around. So I hope that you will move away from the 100 by 100 thinking and see the broader picture. And I certainly hope that you'll do the right thing and deny this request. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that wishes to speak? Okay, close the public hearing. Uh, the applicant can come forward and address some of the issues that have been discussed and answer questions. Thank you. Um, I believe I can address three or four pieces of information, um, both through our previous submissions and um, with an additional photograph. There's been some testimony this evening that the trees that are on the plan, <coughs> excuse me, again, I apologize for my uh, throat. Sorry, right. just use the mic. Fact, oh. um, out of the field, but these are photographs that show the location of that with respect to the stream and with respect to the trees. And when you walk the site and look at this, yes, there are trees in that area that are going to be um, cut down, but there are significant trees down and along the stream and on the other side of the stream that will remain. The dark line that's put on there is the 25-foot buffer interpolated off um, the stream. There have been some question about the removal of those trees, changing that um, area in terms of shade and shade value. The effect of removing those trees is we will get a little more sunlight up in here, but the mass of the building throughout the day will continue to shade that area in a manner not unlike the canopy of oak trees that are there. So I think we've done a fairly accurate representation of trees that will remain and trees that will be taken down and depicted what's there. There's been testimony about whether or not this tree, that oak tree there, or that tree specifically will survive. I think there's a chance that those will die. However, in a shallow rooted uh, condition like this with ledge, where you have the oaks, that root penetration is very close um, to the surface. And as you can see, we haven't put fill in those areas. It's the fill and compaction of the aeration zone that typically will kill the trees. There is a chance they will die if there is fill put open. There's also a chance they'll die if, in fact, we get into a main tap room in the installation of that foundation. But the way it's designed right now, those trees will be left there and are trying to be saved as a part of this proposal. So we've not been trying to mislead the board in terms of what would be there. That will be what's there when that house is built. In fact, you've got the testimony, these two, couldn't that go based on the specific conditions that are um, now there? There was another question about the conditions of the road. You saw Hamlin Street and the conditions of Hamlin Street. What we've shown on our plan is that we are placing approximately eight inches of fill. We're increasing that depth right there by about eight inches, but we're tapering that back to a zero line here. So we will not put water back into this driveway on the west side. We've looked at that um, very deliberately and have reshaped that specifically to avoid the condition you saw on that slide, which was the two ruts um, in the gravel. We recognize that there is going to be work in there to get those utilities under. In fact, we are going to have to snake that utility under, but we know that. We understand that um, from the construction technique. The only other piece I can address is the question from the neighbor about interruption of that drain line, we can't interrupt that. We don't plan to interrupt that. As a part of that construction, 
um, technique. We're going to color that, put that line on, and then finish the backfilling it out. So there will not be an interruption of that service, uh, specifically because of the issue of impoundment and potential flooding. If the board recalls, we had investigated originally bumping that 18-inch line up to a 24-inch based on the upstream watershed size, and then decided not to do that based on this stream channel capacity down, down gradient. So in fact, we had looked through that, discussed that on the site, and based on neighbor's testimony, decided to leave that right at its present size because it's functioning well within this overall stream hydrology. Um, my final comment is, in the original submission package, we did address each of the standards um, that are in and under the board's review for this package. The specific thing we're requesting is that RP zone, RP wetland permit, sorry, for that culvert. We're not impacting and changing that wetland as a result of this. So we've given you documentation on this, as I said earlier, to identify the issues with that with respect to not impacting wetland. But the board's purview, as I understand it, is really that issue of the culvert and the culvert extension. Additional questions for me? Questions? Mr. Charles? Mr. Moore, my apologies. I may ask you some things that we previously had described to us, but I just want to make sure I'm up to speed. So I've got a couple of detailed questions to ask. On the plans, the culvert extension um, is the same size as the existing culvert? Yes, it is. Because I'm confused. It says 15-inch high-density polyethylene. And then it says match existing, but the other one's 18 inch. The existing line is 18 inches. So why would it say 15 inches on the, the extension? Are you looking at the current set of plans? I was looking at the site grading plan. And it's the note. Um, and that's a, that's a mislabeling on a plan. The detail shows there's an 18 inch. OK. So it, it, it ain't getting smaller, is what you're saying? No, but I want it cannot get smaller. So then I guess the comment would be final plans might want to correct that. If that's we will. Thank you. Um, Mr. Lyman raised a question about a water pipe that goes under the culvert or under where the culvert extension would be. Has that been factored into construction planning? It has. That water line, he's accurate, that water line extension does come right along that shoulder. And our pipe actually, pipe extension passes above that. Some of our excavation may get close to that or into it. Obviously, dig safe is required. That'll get noticed, picked up. And will not get. There. So even though that's not a municipal line, dig safe still Correct. covers that? Okay. Thank you. Joe's got um, I have a photo, and this was verified by the Portland Water District, that there is a water shadow already stuck to this lot. So Mr. Lyman's um, water line shouldn't interfere with uh, any water service to this property. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Moore, can you comment? There were a couple of, of questions about the scale of the drawings and location of other structures on adjacent lots. Um, again, the original 100 by 100 lot, Hamlin, were all located by instrument survey. The trees were located by tape. These building corners right here were picked off of an aerial survey of the town. So they will have discrepancies. They will be off. We did not go on and field survey those four points, those two points of each house. Can you give me some sense as to how far off they might be? Um, again, based on that aerial survey, we thought they were within three to five feet of where the actual buildings were. OK. Well, uh, and just as a comment, we all walked that site and spent a, a fair amount of time out there. And from my recollection, that's pretty much where the buildings were. I was just concerned that there wasn't there wasn't some large variation as we look at the plans that we're you know we're getting the wrong impression. Uh, there was a question about maintaining a, a very narrow buffer during construction and the need to be able to move construction equipment around once there's a foundation and a you know framing has begun. Can you comment on that? Uh, I can, and that's something that Joe and I specifically worked out on this. The narrow buff buffer. The narrowest buffer, I should say, is this buffer between the house and the stream and that silt fence. We, in fact, with the absence of these decks, you have a considerable corridor here and back down this side. I believe this is 10 feet, 
and I believe that's about 12 or 15 feet on that side. And Joe and I have had specific discussions about his level of comfort with the equipment and means and methods to do this. You need to add to that, Joe, or are you? That's, we're satisfied that it can be built that way. On this diagram, it shows quite a long side on the left side of the property. Um, that's not accurate. It's, it's only 24 feet from, from the rear property to the front property line. And any machine can set on the front or the rear and do any grading that's necessary with a small bucket. Uh, we don't expect that this to be a problem. Uh, again, I indicated that I, I'm hoping that there'll be no blasting involved and that this will be a daylight basement, which will minimize any type of uh, excavation on that side. The, uh, I think the building envelope is uh, 40, 40 feet plus, and the size of the house that I'm talking about is approximately 36 feet wide, so there's an additional two feet on either side, and we, could, we can hug it to the right side of the property and, uh, and maximize this, this space over here. But, uh, you know, the, the, the plan, uh, for the lot is, is still flexible, but uh, um, you know, I've heard a lot of discussion about the lot and, and don't and, and don't uh, grant the ability to build. This lot is, is eligible for building permit right now. I don't need tonight's approval to get a building permit. We're not talking whether you're going to issue or approve a building permit or not. And the the uh, the design of the house certainly is going to. Uh, address all the, the limitations that uh, uh, are in place. But what we're talking about is the improving the road, and I, and I believe that uh, one of the letters that you received um, voiced or penned the concern about the danger of the road. What we're trying to do is take an ugly situation and prove it. There were several photos tonight on the screen that indicated a muddy road right now. If you go down there tonight or tomorrow, you'll see that it's almost impassable with, with the ruts in the road and, and the mud. And what we're trying to do is basically be a good neighbor and improve the road system, widen it, so that someone can back out of the yard. Uh, they talked about my bought, buying what, well, Free Stevenson. Um, I discussed with some of the neighbors about the um, road improvement uh, provision of the deed that I purchased. And they said, well, don't pay any attention to that. Based on their conversation and their comments, at my own expense, I improved the road. It was full of ruts, and I don't know how anyone would agree to plow the road during the winter months. So I hired Smith & Son, a professional excavator. We discussed the, pave, uh, the, um, the regrading of that road. And uh, with the consultation of, of uh, a couple of engineers, we graded it so that they wouldn't increase any additional water problems. But what we're trying to do here is to improve a situation that in case you need emergency vehicles to access houses on either side of this lot, uh, they'll be able to do it. And uh, you know, I, I, I want to redirect our, our concerns and what we're here for tonight. Uh, if I drifted from your question, I apologize, but I think it was necessary to say that. That's fine. It's all helpful. answer your question. Yes, sir. One more. Good. I'm done for the moment. How are you going to remove snow from the site? Well, this is an unusual winter. Hopefully, hopefully there'll uh, there'll be enough uh, area on that side. We're talking uh, a minimum of 12 feet, and we can push it up on the high side, and uh, you know, use a snow blower or whatever to clear it. Um, you also have 25 feet before you get to the stream. So there is some area on that side. And again, the house will set back, so we can push it off to the, to the right and away from the, uh, away from the driveway. Thank we'll you. probably do the same thing that the neighbors are doing. Right? Other questions? Mr. Moore, I have a couple of questions, if you may. Um, is there a pending DEP permit? The DEP permit has already been approved. 
um, that was submitted in our original package okay. review, and the DEP permit was approved based on this identical plan. And that had to do with the uh, the setback and buffer from the edge of the wetland? From the stream. From the stream. Um, do you have any comment on the the issue of wildlife or impact on that? Have you looked at that issue at all? Um, we only looked at it from a strict standpoint of checking the IFNW and critical areas programs to see if this was listed on a critical nesting habitat. And we did not find that working through the gray IFNW office. So that's, that's the only extent that I can comment on. Okay. And Mr. Moore, you've seen uh, the letter from the town engineer of March 10th? Yes, I have. We have seen the latest uh, letter from Stephen Harding in which he asked us to uh, please change the plans to indicate that the toe slope of the riprap extended at least 12 inches out um, from the toe of the slope, and we have done that on a set of drawings. Um, in addition, we have stricken the comment about the footbridge and the footpath uh, from the deed, so there is no proposal for either of those activities within that buffer area. So those have been removed from the, the deed restriction. And for the benefit of the board and also the people that are here, can you just tell us again what was done to determine the uh, uh, what you explained before about the runoff and the water flow through the, the culvert? Uh, uh, absolutely. When the project was first initiated, um, we took a quick look at this to understand the runoff implications um, using the rational method. Rational method is just a simple methodology that says the runoff um, is equal to area times intensity Times. I'm looking at one of the engineers back here, CIA, runoff coefficient, thank you. Um, and that methodology is one that's been approved by uh, the state, it's been approved by the town engineer here in Cape Elizabeth and is used in a number of municipalities. When you get watersheds that are smaller than a quarter of an acre, because um, other methodologies don't prove as accurate for that smaller watershed. When the question came up last time about wanting to see those calculations, we went back through and formalized those and then put the cover sheet on it that's in your package. Essentially what we said in that package was that in this particular area, we looked at this site itself and the runoff from this site. And what we found was, yes, there was an increase um, in this site. That increase um, was, again, for accuracy point, or 0 0.02 CFS. Um, what we were measuring that against was not just this site by itself, but this site within the larger context of this whole watershed. So we went back and looked at the larger 42-acre watershed upstream that is upgrading of the road. We then looked at this channel capacity here. The limiting factor in this watershed is that existing 18-inch culvert why I'm so sure that I, I know that size, is we triple check that size and the pitch on the pipe to arrive at the flow that comes through there when that pipe is running full, which is 17.5 CFS. So we know, <clears throat> even when that pond backs up, that that pipe is putting out 17.5 CFS. A cubic foot a second is 420 gallons a minute just to give you some sense of, of volume. What we looked at then was what our increase was against that 17.5 CFS. And that increase was two one hundredths of a percent. 
but more importantly than just that increase in the larger flow was the fact that in that 42 acre watershed, depending upon the storm event, the peak flow comes through that anywhere from 15 minutes to an hour. Our peak flow, in other words, the maximum amount coming off of this site, occurs in a relatively short time. It occurs in five to seven minutes. So what we said in that report was, regardless of what that increase was, that increase itself wasn't measurable, wasn't significant, but more importantly, our peak came off and was already well downstream before the larger peak comes, hits that culvert and passes through. The key of that being that our peak does not compound or increase the peak flow that comes down here. No matter what happens, there'll never be more than 17.5 CFS coming right through there as long as you don't have a storm event that puts more than that amount in that larger watershed. But that culvert acts like that as well. Thank you. There has been a tremendous amount of concern expressed about the stormwater runoff. And, and I realize I've read all of I'm afraid I'm not as familiar with all the numbers, but I read all the numbers before I came tonight. And I know that you're asking for a resource protection permit just for the pipe, for the culvert. Um, but what do you anticipate will happen in terms of the runoff when the trees, when some of the trees may have to be removed? Do you think that will increase the runoff more than you've calculated? or The effect of the loss of these two additional trees will not change that runoff calculation. My other question has to do with the road, and it's more curiosity than anything, because I looked at those photographs, too, and said, that looks pretty impassable. Um, Mr. Fristashi mentioned that you had done some work on the road, and yet these photographs were just taken. That work, the work oh, that Mr. Fristashi was talking about was on Stevenson. Oh, okay. Not on Hamlin. Not on Hamlin. How is that road maintained? And do you know? And um, Because it is in terrible condition. It's not a town road. It's a private road. So any maintenance that occurs is a result of the neighbors that are in there working on it. And this question, again, has nothing to do with the resource protection permit. I'm curious, but when you, re, when you reconfigure the road um, and add to it, is that going to control the runoff better, or is it going to make it? Right now, that roadway isn't crowned. It's just ditched in the center, and you can see the water in the wheel ruts. The sections that are on the plans show it recreate it as a crown, so it will in fact shed that water in a way that it doesn't now. That does take maintenance because it's a gravel road, it takes maintenance to keep that crown, but when it's done it will be crowned, so it will improve that drainage, so to speak, in that road by keeping that road drier. And then that drainage will go into the culvert, into the pipe under the culvert? Half of it will go into the culvert as it does now, the other half will run down the bank and into lot 50. Thank you. You say that it will require maintenance. What, what is there to assure us that that maintenance will be done that would further assure that the runoff would remain as you represent? Um, only the goodwill of the neighbors and their interest in keeping that road passable. Any other questions? Comments? Mr. Chairman? Here. In reviewing the town ordinances and going over the application, uh, if we keep ourselves within the boundary of the resource protection permit, I don't think there's very little that can be done to deny this application. However, I would like to make some comments based on the fact that I've resided in a house about a half mile from this site. It's a large 12,000 square foot triangle, a lot of which 180 feet, the longest side of that triangle borders on a trout stream. It crosses under Route 77. And I challenge any engineer to come up with a model plan or anything in his or her education or anything available to the Department of Environmental Protection that will show me what I've witnessed with my own two eyes outside my living room window. Uh, there's never been an engineer that agreed with me that that trout stream is affected by high tide. But I can tell you I can watch 
that stream rise over 12 feet in the day of a nor'easter, arriving in Portland Harbor at high tide, and 10 hours later, it's 10 feet, 12 feet less. I've seen my own cellar flood. Uh, I've seen my neighbors on the other side, this frontage on State Ave, but their backyards borders on this trout stream. I've seen them in very subtle ways continue construction of their backyards. Uh, mm -hmm. I can tell you sitting on this board for 10 years, I've not disturbed one blade of grass in mine, and you can tell because all the silt and debris and the wood are on my side of the trout stream, not on my neighbors. And uh, I just know what's going to happen in a small way, and in a small way every time a, a house lot is developed within this particular neighborhood is the watershed is going to change. And uh, I'm very uncomfortable seeing it continued based on my own recollections of living in a wetland area myself in a neighborhood very nearby to here. No one can really tell what happens uh, in a watershed like this with a small stream running through it. And uh, I know the characteristics of this land and the neighbor's land around it, including their lots, is going to change dramatically in the next two to three weeks as we go through the spring melt. And the application itself, I'm just personally uncomfortable with. But as the zoning is written and the fact that we're limited to only the resource protection permit and the developing of the entrance to the driveway, uh, there's very little as an individual board member I can do about it. Thank you. Well, I, I'd, go ahead. I, w I would like to echo what was just said. I am very concerned for the abutting neighbors. I, I've been out. We did spend some time on the lot. We were concerned, many of us, when we saw the lot. And I, too, am struggling with the fact that we're being asked to approve something that is very limited. We have no jurisdiction over whether or not this home is constructed on this lot. But as an individual board member, I would like to say that it, in voting in favor to approve, I'm only voting because I have no choice in terms of the regulations. I am not voting what my heart and conscience would vote because I do think there will be changes and I do think that the abutting neighbors have a very serious situation. Thank you. I just want to say ditto uh, with respect to the two preceding board members' comments. And I, I really do want to say I appreciate the fact that all of the abutters came out and spoke so eloquently about their concerns. Uh, I, I found this to be a very impressive um, uh, presentation by everybody. And I, and I really want to thank, uh, I believe it was Ms. Babcock, who gave us a historical perspective about what's, what's been going on in that neighborhood. And I think that's true of neighborhoods all over our town. And it just brings me back uh, to the notion that if, and I hate to say this, but if, if, you're, if you don't want a lot in your neighborhood to be developed, there's only one really good way to prevent that from happening, and that's to buy it. And I know that's unrealistic uh, for most people. And uh, I also have the same concerns that everybody else has expressed. But based on what we're being asked to do tonight, I would vote to approve the application. Right. Maureen, this is a question for you. Um, would there be any value in requiring a storm um, in, in, not adhere, uh, in not agreeing to the waiver for a stormwater management plan in terms of the ordinance? And yeah, I think you already granted that last month. The, the, other, the other problem, and if Steve Harding was here, he could explain it to you, but the rational method is it's a model. And it's a model that is actually preferred under our stormwater ordinance. But um, Owens McCullough is here, and he'll tell you that, like any model, you're working with a pitchfork, not a laser. So the smaller the area gets, the, um, the less useful the model becomes, because it's, it's really not an exact science. So you know, even if we were to say, go out and do more than they've already done, and, and I mean, they, they've pretty much done the stormwater calculations. The 0.02 CFS increase is, is the result of a stormwater calculation. Correct me, Steve, if I'm wrong, but I mean, they, they look at the, the, 
the context of the soil, you know, ledge tends to sheet flow more water than, than a nice peaty soil, and that's how they figured out what, what their water flow off of the site is going to be. So you know, my guess is that you're, you're not going to get any more, you, any more accurate information than you already have because models are in themselves limiting. Well, I, I, I'd like to say as well, first of all, I'd like to thank everyone for coming out and providing us with very useful information. Um, as incongruous as it sounds, however, while obviously the, the whole reason to widen the road and alter the culvert and build a driveway is to build a house on this site, um, our review has nothing to do with the, the ultimate goal of widening the road. We are limited in reviewing only whether the widening of that road and the alteration of the culvert meet the standard for a resource protection permit. Um, while we may have questions and concerns, and I believe you've heard the board express those concerns con about building a house uh, on that lot in the building envelope close to the wetland, um, that is not an issue that, that we can address. Um, and under the requirements for the resource protection permit, and they were listed earlier, we are to look at whether the, the widening of that road and the alteration of that culvert changes things to such an extent that it affects any of those areas that were specified. Um, unfortunately, I haven't heard anything tonight that would say that just widening that road and basically using the same size culvert that was there before, aside from the fact that there will be a house there, and I know it's strange to say that that has to be ignored, but for those two things only, that that would change things so dramatically that it would not meet the uh, standard of the resource protection permit. Uh, it's a very narrow issue. Um, the, uh, the resource protection permit is for a very small part of the road that needs to be widened. The culvert is basically the same uh, in size. Uh, and if I was listening carefully, I believe most of the concerns, which were very valid, have to do with the location of the house in that building envelope and, and the effect of building that house and the effect of having that house so close to neighbors and so close to the wetland, but that is not really an issue uh, that, that that we have to look at. Uh, Maureen, do you want to add to anything? Is that, am I accurate in my review of the regulations? Um, so I, I join in the other board members in feeling <coughs> uncomfortable about the end result here, which is the building of the house in that lot, but um, we have to follow what our uh, jurisdiction and, and purpose is, and Mr. Fristacci is right when he says if a building permit is issued for that lot, that is not an issue that we, that we can deal with. Uh, so, uh, I appreciate the concerns, but you have to understand the jurisdiction and the review of, of the board. Uh, well, again, we, we've had the public hearing. Um, I, I believe what I just said is building the house is not an issue that, that we can look at and is not the application before us. The application before us is widening the road and altering the culvert only. Um, frankly, the, they could have come to us with an application without the house and we would still have to, have to rule on, on that issue. So I'm sorry, we can't take any further comments. The public hearing uh, has been closed. Uh, any further discussion? Mr. Chairman? Yes. Just a couple of other things. Um, I too sympathize and share the concerns of the, of the neighbors. Uh, 
I'm encouraged to see that although the, the application is solely for a resource protection permit, the plans do show a building envelope which limits the location of that house. Uh, they show a setback area around the stream and I'm encouraged that there's actually a greater buffer around the stream on this building lot than there are on a joint lot, so uh, at least it's not going to get any worse. Um, but I think Mr. Cotter probably made the most coherent statement about this a couple months ago. This represents infill development in a town with very rapidly increasing property values, and I suspect we're going to see more of these. Uh, but if the lot is buildable under the, the ordinances that exist, I think we have to respect the rights of both the property owner and the abutters and try and do what, what the, the law and the regulations specify. I would like to suggest one addition to the motion that we consider. I find another place on the plans that refers to a 15-inch culvert. I don't know what size it is, but I'd like a, a condition on the approval if there's one granted that um, adds that the plans be revised to reflect any culvert sizes that refer to the actual size of the existing culvert so that there's no decrease in the, in the diameter of that. And I, too, will reluctantly vote in, in favor of this application. We have and I'm prepared to make a motion if you so desire. Go ahead, Mr. Charles. <coughs> motion for the board to consider. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Joseph Fistacci for a resource protection permit to widen Hamlin Street and related culvert improvements for a lot located off Hamlin Street, U29-50, be approved with the following conditions. One, that a note be added to the plans that the building footprint is illustrative and any structure must be located within the building envelope. Two, that the plans be revised for the town engineer's letter dated March 10, 2003. And three, that all references on the plans to the culvert extension be revised to reflect a pipe diameter that matches the existing culvert. Is that an appropriately worded condition, Maureen? Okay, the motion's been made. Is there a second? Second. The motion's been made and seconded. Is there any further discussion from the board on the motion at this time? All in favor? It's unanimous. Motion carries. Thank you. Okay, um, obviously we're running fairly long, so if, Mr. McCall, if you don't mind starting while we're transitioning from one issue to the other, uh, that would be great. This is the uh, second item on the agenda, Leighton Farm Subdivision, a request by Joel Fitzpatrick of Wiley Enterprises for preliminary subdivision review and a resource protection permit for Leighton Farms. 16 lot subdivision located off Wells Road. Uh, good evening. Good evening. My name is Owens McCullough. I'm a civil engineer with the firm of Sebago Technics here tonight on behalf of Wiley Enterprises. Uh, with me tonight is Joel Fitzpatrick, the principal of Wiley Enterprises. Um, we were last before the board, I believe it was on February 10th, 
2003 for a public hearing. And after that meeting, we prepared some revised plans and submitted those plans to move forward with the preliminary uh, approval process. Um, and going through the memorandum that Maureen prepared, um, it asked that the applicant summarize the changes to the plan. So I'll, I'll focus my presentation. Yes, thank you. Uh, the changes to the plan have been really in response to the town planners uh, review uh, comments by the planning board and uh, the town engineer who did the peer review on this project. Uh, those include on the cover sheet uh, renumbering the lots to match the assessor's requirements uh, for the map number lot 32-1, 32-2 and so on. So those changes were made to the plan. Also there were some engineering uh, requests by OST Associates, uh, things such as indicating the granite monument in the center of the cul-de-sac. The thought was that if we had a granite monument in, in the center, that because this is a raised radius, it would make it easier to re-establish the, uh, uh, the right-of-way line at a future date. Uh, so we have added that to the plan. Uh, the no there was also a uh, notation in, added to the plan that uh, indicated that the location of the proposed footpath would be uh, completed in consultation with the Conservation Commission and uh, Town Planner. Uh, note uh, 20 on the subdivision uh, was added that specified that lots 2, 3, or 4, which are these lots right here, uh, are to be designated as uh, the affordable housing lot. Uh, the applicant is required to provide one low-income affordable housing or two moderate income, if I remember that correctly and the applicant is proposing to do one low-income house on one of those three lots, two, three, or four. So that it, And there's actually a note on the plan that designates. I think that was something that we discussed at the last meeting. You're welcome. On the grading plan, uh, we also added some supplemental details requested by OST Associates. Uh, one of those items was that uh, the culvert, which goes underneath uh, the Wells Road, when uh, one thing we were working on was finalizing the engineering details for the stormwater drainage plan. And that's something that we've been working in close coordination with the town, uh, the public works director, and the town engineer. Uh, because in our analysis, it showed that this culvert down here at Wells Road had the potential to overtop. The numbers indicated that we got very close to the top of the road. The public works director and town engineer uh, re recommended that we increase the size of that culvert from 24 inches to 30 inches in size. That would provide for better hydrology and then and actually lowered the ponding elevation across, uh, across the street. So we have done that. Uh, the other thing that we're in the process of doing, which would be provided as part of final plan, submittal is an easement across the applicant who owns the property across the street. The town has asked if we provide an easement to the town uh, for that drainage that's coming across. This culvert uh, also conveys drainage not only from this project, but also from the Cross Hill project. When we modeled our stormwater, we actually went back to the design engineer of Cross Hill, took their information, put it in with ours so that we had the best representative model we could. And that indicated, uh, led us to the indication that that culvert should be replaced, which we have done. The other thing that we're doing is some modifications to the latent pond because those same calculations indicate that before any development's done, as it is now, the outlet of that pond is undersized and in a large storm event, as it exists today, has the potential to overtop and actually could create some flooding concerns out in this area. So we took that into account too and have modified the pond outlet to correct that pre-existing condition. Um, on the utility plan, some more engineering comments. Uh, a couple of things. Uh, we had a light pole located up where the sidewalk ended. That light pole, when we had put it on the plan, was right at the end of the sidewalk and was actually a conflict with the sidewalk, so we moved the light pole out of the way. Um, a couple of other items um, was requested that we provide a, uh, as you remember, we're going to bring sewer across through this right of way, which uh, over to Cross Hill and tie into the sewer manhole over here. And when we do that, uh, the uh, town engineer asked that we leave a, a 12 foot wide gravel uh, surface covered with loam. It'll be revegetated, but it'll provide a stable surface 
in the event that they would ever need to bring any equipment to service that uh, sewer line out there. So yeah, it'll, it'll be grassed over. It's part of the path, part of the walkway. Uh, it'll be revegetated. You won't even know a road's there, but the space will be there in case the town ever had to get into it and say clean a manhole or, or, or uh, fix a plug that could There happen. can't be any trees or bushes or anything on it? Not on the gravel roadway, no. We do have some landscaping that we're proposing along this edge of the property here. Uh, and what we're going to do is hold that landscaping as close to the property line as we can between the edge of the gravel and the, and the right-of-way line. That's going to provide some buffering. This house right here has a driveway uh, and is built very close to the property line. And so we're going to put some plantings in there. And I actually added a note to the plan that uh, involves Maureen a little bit. Uh, but at the time of construction, before those plants are planted, there's some coordination done to pick the right places for those plantings. And I think it's 10 uh, fir trees that are supposed to be planted along there. Uh, also, uh, there was some engineering details they asked to be detailed of slopes, lengths, and some inverts on the storm drain system that's within the road plan and profile. That has since been uh, added to the information. And also, uh, an emergency spillway. And I, I talked to this a little earlier at the outlet from this pond. Um, we needed to modify the emergency spillway or the, the spillway from the pond to handle the drainage that's coming through there now and for the future. And that was correcting a problem that actually exists today. Uh, those have been the substantive changes to the plans. Uh, what we, uh, Maureen prepared a uh, item topic of discussion which includes uh, a, quite, a couple of items on the street design. One had to do with uh, the esplanades, making sure that uh, we have some notation on the plan that uh, doesn't, I, apparently there have been some other subdivisions where they've had esplanades between the sidewalks that were very steep. Um, in other words, the sidewalk and then it was a very steep slope down to the road. And what we're going to do um, Ost pointed this out too, was keep it at a 2%, which is the same cross slope on a sidewalk, so that you don't get, you're walking along the street and you don't get a real steep esplanade and then a sidewalk up on top. They'll be just about at the same level, sloping towards the street line. And I think that will help for snow storage too. Um, also within that esplanade, uh, uh, it's been requested that we add some notation to the plan to ensure that when they put the gravel road in, the gravel doesn't go underneath the esplanade because if you get compacted gravel, it makes it very difficult for the root systems of trees to grow, which was an excellent point. So we are modifying the plans to show a common borrow material, a material more suitable for a growing medium. Um, that was an excellent point. Uh, Stormwater, I talked uh, quite a bit uh, at length about that. Um, we've been working with those associates. We've actually filed our stormwater permit application with the name Maine DEP. Uh, that's currently undergoing review. In fact, we have a meeting with them this Friday uh, to continue that process. Uh, Maureen asked about um, at the outlet of this pond, um, there's a riprap swell that will come down to this outlet location. That riprap is put in there for stability a flow coming out of that pond. In other words, when water discharges from the pond in larger storm events, it can be of such velocity and such quantity that it can scour the vegetated surface eroding that area. And so we armor it with riprap, basically a riprap swell. And the thought, uh, Maureen pointed out that uh, sometimes that riprap is very obtrusive there. You can see it, it stands out. And uh, had asked about us planting some trees uh, to soften that along the Wells Road. And we are going to do that and talk with Joel, and that will be on the next submittal uh, to, to do that. Um, and then the trails, and uh, the last one was the applicant has added some trails and notes to the plan, uh, will be located in, in consultation with the Conservation Commission. The note should be expanded to include placement of the green belt signage uh, by the applicant. Uh, we will do that. Um, that uh, dovetails with a comment by Oast Associates, which talked about the locations of the bollards. Uh, basically, uh, there's a trail that comes up through here, Layton Farm, 
over here to uh, Steeple Bush, and, and we'll put bollards and signs at each of those. There's also some trails through here, and there'll be appropriate signage in accordance with the Greenbelt Tree Policy. Um, sorry, Maureen, I put your name on the next note for the submittal to, to coordinate with to make sure we get them in the right place. Um, and with that, those are the changes to the plans. Um, we have, we are, we'll certainly make the other recommendations that Maureen has added and hopefully move forward with the project. Thank you and we're glad to answer any questions. Any questions of the applicant? Yes, Barbara. Um, the question has to do with some of the questions by the abutters from Cross Hill. And one of them was there, there was one of them made the comment about the 25% grading, but I read in your information that the grading runs between 8 and 12% on this lot. Is that correct? On this um, parcel? Yeah, let me expand on that. The ordinance has a requirement that you deduct slopes that are 25% or greater that are one acre or, or more that are contiguous. So in other words, if you have slopes that are 25% or greater and, have, and then are larger than an acre in size, an acre or larger, then you have to deduct those from your net residential calculations. Within the site, the general slopes are 8 to 12%. There are a few pockets because with the marvels of computers, we can have the computers tell us where those slopes are. There are, there are some areas that do have micro pockets of slopes that are 25%, but they're not a one acre of contiguous slopes. There's some pockets, just a few areas, especially um, there's a couple areas over here and then over in here. There's really none, there are none on this portion of the site, but there are a couple of areas that have slopes that do reach that, but they're isolated, they're not contiguous, so that, and therefore they weren't deducted in the calculations. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? Um, in, uh, in Mr. Howe's letter, I don't know if you've had a chance to see that, he talked about a couple of issues, one being uh, urging us to require a, a tree survey which would more accurately reflect which trees would remain and which would, would stay. But do you have any feeling on that one way or the other? Well, uh, what I would like to do is I'll go back to um, layout of the subdivision. Um, one thing, the green represents the open space. We have, I think we talked about this earlier, that this photo, there's a larger section of open space that helps, that enlarges this other section of town open space and works more towards the Jordan Pond. Within the development, there is also um, open space around the perimeter of the lot, in particular along the Cross Hill subdivision and I think in my cover letter I talked about uh, that at the narrowest point there's 35 feet of uh, buffer and, it, and that enlarges to over 100 feet as you go along the sidelines of the property. So what happens is, is that there'll be this natural buffer that is left as it is out there today within that area. Within the individual lots, the applicant has this as what's, what he's done on past projects, develops the lots individually and he strives to develop each of the lots in a manner that fits the house to the lot, not the lot to the house. And there are, but I think Joel actually spoke to this at the last meeting, that often what he finds is they try to save trees where they can uh, when, they, when they develop the lots. Um, not, they can't always save all the trees they would like to, but they do try to save as many as they can when they develop the lots. Um, historically, the types of houses the, that they construct in here have seen a pretty aggressive landscaping plan uh, that people generally do on their own around the houses, in between the houses. Also, we're required by ordinance to plant street trees 40 feet on center along the roadway coming in. So what you end up with is we have we envelope the subdivision in a buffer around it. There'll be street trees planted along it, and then that leaves within the subdivision the individual lots that we've right. But you're saying in the buffer area, you don't anticipate removing 
any trees, except obviously for where the sewer line. The sewer, that's correct. And storm and the storm water. The uh, yes, I'm, this is actually open right now into the pond in here, but uh, the drainage comes down through here and then over to Wells Road. And this this area is pretty much open. I think the aerial photograph, which is this area right here, right behind the existing farmhouse. You know, I, I would certainly prefer that those trees in the buffer area remain. Uh, I think it's important for the, uh, the abutters and, and the neighbors. Now, uh, if you're saying all those trees will remain, perhaps there's a way we can, we can confirm that so that that can be verified later on. Uh, what we have done is added a stipulation to the subdivision plan that these group, that within the open space, of course, with the exception of the, the, the tension pond and the easement, that that open space is to remain undisturbed in perpetuity. Right. The only exclusions to that are um, that we do have to build a trail as part of the trail system, which is works around the trees and the vegetation and the sewer and the drainage. The rest of it, and that's part of the subdivision. I, actually, I think there's some notation on the plan um, that stipulates that those trees, that those trees, that area is to remain undisturbed. Okay. Well, that that certainly would would satisfy my concern. Um, the uh, question about building the sewer line and its proximity to the Butters' homes. Could you address that? Yes, I can. The subdivision, we're going to bring a sewer from Leighton Farm, Farm Road across this easement over to Steeplebush Road. There are, these are developed house lots that have been built on. The right of way we're coming through actually was a sec, was looked at initially as a potential connection for a road coming through. But we opted, because of the length of our road, we didn't need to have a second point of connection. The applicant uh, really didn't want to bring a road in for the simple reason that um, he thought that that would that would actually disturb a lot more than just bringing the sewer through. So um, the goal is just to bring the sewer through, and when we come through um, through this area here, um, the sewer line is we picked the location, and this plan doesn't show it real well, but there's a look the, the ground is coming up like this. We picked the location that we feel has the, the least amount of disturbance coming through to hook into the sewer over here. Typically, you're going to go through and see a 30-foot wide area that has to be cleared uh, just to get the equipment in and build the sewer. The easement, the uh, right-of-way is 50 feet wide, so you see 30 feet. We've actually hugged the sewer to the lower end as much as we could because there's some better vegeta vegetation on the upper side that we're going to try to save, and then we have some planting that's going in there. Um, if there is blasting, uh, ledge removal, uh, which is highly likely on this project, uh, a blasting plan is required, just like the, the work that's been done in the Cross Hill subdivision. Uh, the blasters have to be insured. They have to follow pre-blast surveys and protocols within certain proximities of houses. So all those have to be followed. And if there's, you know, God forbid, if there was any damage done, then there's the insurance, there's provisions to take care of that. I hope that gets at your question. <laughs> yes. Yes. While you're on blasting, mm -hmm. <clears throat> will the abutters be notified well in advance that there will be blasting so that they know? They, um, if the blasters, and I don't know the exact distance, but within a certain distance, the laws require that pre-blast surveys be done. And that means you have to contact the neighbors within a certain distance and videotape their foundations. And I know that Joel's experienced that on some other projects. What's that? Five, 500 feet. He knew it better than I did because he just went through it, so. <laughs> the questions? Thank you.
Anyone like to make a motion? Yes, Mr. Chairman. I have a motion for the board to consider. Be it ordered that based on the plans and material submitted and the facts presented, the application of Wiley Enterprises LLC for major subdivision review and a resource protection permit to construct Layton Farms, a 16 lot subdivision located off Wells Road, be approved with the following conditions. One, that a note be added to the plan that the esplanade be filled with in C2 material or a substitute that can support tree growth. A maximum grade for the esplanade shall also be added to the plans suitable to promote tree growth. Two, that the applicant add trees to the plans that will serve to soften the view of the riprap areas from Layton Farms Road and Wells Road. Three, that the trails note be expanded that the trails noted, excuse me, is that a note? No. Oh, that the trails note, excuse me, be expanded to include the placement of green belt signage by the applicant at the direction of the Conservation Commission. Four, that the plans be revised to reflect the comments of the town engineer in his letter dated March 11, 2003. And five, that the plans submitted for final subdivision review reflect these conditions. Okay. It's been moved and <clears throat> seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, uh, all in favor of the motion? Unanimous? Thank you. Motion is approved. Thank you. Thank you. The uh, final item on our agenda is a request for a private access way permit by Marshall and Suzanne Pillsbury, as well as a resource protection permit for a driveway to access a lot located at 78 Two Lights Road. I would just remind the board we need to review this application for uh, completeness first, uh, so keep that in mind. and. Ask the applicant if you can begin by introducing uh, the plan. Yep. My name is Marshall Pillsbury. I own, um, my wife and I own a piece of property out on Two Lights Road, 78 Two Lights Road, and we're requesting um, a um, private access waiver and a resource protection permit. The lot presently does not have it does not have any road frontage on Two Lights Road. My brother Graham and his wife are going to grant us a 35 foot easement um, or driveway to run along his boundary to gain access to our house lot. Um, so it, has that been finalized? Do you have a copy of that or? I didn't have anything from a legal perspective written up. Okay. Um, the legal description has been prepared, but it hasn't been conveyed yet pursuant to the uh, Okay. All right, go ahead. Um, in my original application or original plan, there were some things that were left out. And um, Jim Mullen from Sebago Technics is here, and he uh, reprinted new plans that have been stamped um, that should address most of those concerns. And I also do have a, the wastewater disposal system application from Mark Hampton that I forgot to include in my initial application. And I have these here, so should we bring them up? Sure, yeah. yeah. This plan represents um, the changes since receiving the letter from um, Steve Harding and Host and the recommendations. Uh, and I'll go through one by one. We'll OK, if you can give us a minute. Um, John, could I have the other gentleman identify himself? I don't know who he is. I'm sorry, I'm Jim Mullen, I'm Mr. Bagel Technics. Okay, thank you.
All right, so um, and Mr. Mullen, so, so in other words, you received the letter from the town engineer and you've attempted to address In a very short the, time, yes. The incomplete yes. items. Okay, can you go through those for us then? Because again, the completeness is going to be the first issue we have to deal with. I understand. Um, First thing we were asked to do was we had applied for a 14-foot wide gravel driveway and we've been advised and changed that to 18 feet, standard width of the gravel bed. Um, we had added an invert elevation for the proposed culvert under the proposed driveway, um, as well as details regarding the location of the silt fence and details of the um, um, filter barrier at this end. Um, he had asked for radius, radii to be shown for the curves. We've done that. Um, some detail regarding the stabilization of the construction on the entrance. We would like to ask for a waiver of the stormwater um, report, largely because it's a it, from discussion with the, with the engineers, it appears to be a fairly simple system here. We're proposing an 18-inch culvert. Um, flowage is this way, and you, as you see, just the short distance up here across the property on, this, on the Sullivan property, there's a 10-inch wide culvert. So we we'll only get 10 inches of water coming through here, and we've got an 18-inch opening here. Um, things are flowing this way towards uh, Graham Pillsbury's Pond, which we would actually love to see some more water in. Um, but, um, therefore, because we're only talking about such a small amount of, of additional water, and we're going to such a larger culvert, we would like to see the stormwater report waived. Um, there were a number of things brought up at the workshop and from having, um, had Maureen um, take a look at the plans uh, that have been included with uh, detail what the buffer setbacks are, what the building envelope is. Um, the proposed septic location has been shown on the plan here. Um, we've added the location of the proposed utilities on this side here. Um, as you can see, the 18 foot gravel driveway going to 18 feet did put us a foot or two over in, into the 15 foot wide public access easement. Um, with, but again, we've, we've stayed clear of most of the easement and we shouldn't, I would think, interfere with wherever the proposed walking path is going to go. Um, and I think that covers all the, uh, the additional information we've been asked for, if I have any questions. Yes. I don't think you talked about the first 50 feet being paved. Oh, uh, well, that's the kind of issue. Um, perhaps Marshall would yeah, like to talk about um, that. It's, I think it's been noted on the plan. Right? We, we have added to the plan that... It has been added to the plan. When I was going through this process a couple of months ago now, um, I'd asked Bob Malley if I could have that reduced to 25 feet. And we talked about it and he gave me, from the phone conversation, he said he would talk to Maureen about it, but I had the indication or I was kind of under the assumption that that would be okay or approved. Um, basically what he said is, you've asked the question, we'll take it from here. Um, and I didn't put it in any other documentation or anything. Um, but I did, when I got this letter uh, last Friday, notice that he was asking for a 50-foot tarred um, beginning of the driveway. And if, if it needs to be at 50 feet, that's fine. What I had asked for was 25 feet. And he said it needs to at least be a car length, but obviously longer for, um, for spitting of, of gravel onto two lights road, that type of thing. So, um, 
I guess what I'm asking is if it could be reduced to 25 feet and if this is the forum to do that. I mean, what's the standard? Do you have to request a, a waiver or have you? The, the planning board has the authority to make an adjustment to the standard. Um, the public works director has written a memo stating that he would like 50 foot length paved uh, per the standards in the ordinance. Normally we, while we have that ability, we uh, listen very closely to what town engineer and the public works director has to say because they're the ones that have to deal with the effects of our decisions. So um, we can discuss it here, but frankly, if the public works director prefers 50 feet, then I would normally go along with his, his recommendation. Um, Wayne, is there anything else that that you've identified in terms of completeness that has not been covered other than, I understand you're seeking a waiver of the stormwater yes. runoff plan. Um, um, I, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but I was just going through what you had provided versus what was in the memo. And it looks like that uh, we, have a, we have a plan that's been stamped by a surveyor, uh, a design for the septic system has been submitted. There still is no draft easement deed, although we do have a description of the physical location where that easement would be. Um, there is no information on the plans on underground utilities. Uh, no, I'm, the underground utilities are shown now. Okay. Yeah, that was my understanding that that was now in the plan. Yep. And the maintenance agreement, we're still asking for a waiver of providing a maintenance agreement. All right. We did put a statement on the plan stating um, somewhere that maintenance will be by the owner in the town of Cape Elizabeth is in no way liable for the maintenance in the future. And then under the resource protection completeness, um, there is um, no vegetative cover information that's been submitted delineating the wetland boundary. However, you've, you've provided a wetland boundary based on soils, but we don't have any, anything that says that it's based on soils. You've just provided the wetland boundary information. Is that correct? Um, Mark Hampton did the, did the wetland delineation, and I don't, um, I'm, I'm I don't have anything by him. Testing. Um, so you want to add to the wrong. record verbally right now that, that that wetland delineation was based on soils? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, in, in, in we had discussed that in, uh, some time back when we did the subdivision, what the soils were in the area. Um, it, it took a pretty hard look did, at that then. Did he provide any sort of report other than what's he we plan. he sent a letter that we believe before to the town stating that this was not a stream uh, that it was just an area of wetland vegetation uh, beyond that I don't know if he has provided anything written or not yeah, he, the, the letter about the stream is is in the packet but there was no information that I found about how the actual wetland boundaries were delineated. I do know Mark Hampton is a soil scientist, and yeah. right. yeah. he sure. delineates. My understanding was, we work with Mark a lot, my understanding was he did the soils, and those are his well, flags. Yeah, perhaps if he could just provide a letter to that effect, right. so, so. that would be helpful. So we would have something in the record showing that. Anything else for you? Uh, and then you're asking for a wave of the stormwater. I think, I think that covers the list that we provided. Right. Um, okay, again, we are limited to the issue of completeness for now. Any quest other questions from the board on that issue? Well, it, based on the list that Maureen just read off, it, it seemed that one issue that has not been rectified or it appears to be fixable is this easement. Uh, and I assume you're going to get one. But it, uh, but where where does that stand right now? Uh, it, we simply have, hasn't been put into la language by an attorney. The description has been written. Uh, Grant, Rusty Graham has agreed to it. We simply have not had it taken by a lawyer in the legal language put before and after the after the easement I, itself. It, I guess my view on that is that obviously it's such an integral part of being able to build the road. But on the other hand, it's clearly so integral and clearly such a condition to approval that if it's provided at a later time, I wouldn't be uncomfortable about uh, ruling on completeness tonight with the condition that that be provided. Because uh, obviously if it isn't, 
you can't do any of this. So. Isn't, the, isn't what that reads like specifically part of what we're passing on in completeness? What, what, what the, the, easement? the easement. I mean, what it this, this, this doesn't fly, but I understand what the engineer is saying. They're going to give this to an attorney and have him put it into... Right. But I, I personally would like to see that before I, I'm asked to rule on completeness. And maybe I'm not trying to slow things up here. Well, uh, I guess my view is that on the issue of completeness, given the fact that they have to provide that easement at a later time, rather than hold everything up... Fine. Okay. And but, but the legal lease will just be there. It's not going to be signed and notarized, so it isn't it have any real legal holding, whether it has legally on it or not. You know, you don't want to exchange the actual rights. And no, I, I, that I understand completely. Right. That's a chicken and an egg kind of thing. Yeah. But I think we want to see what it's going to say exactly as part of the application. Maureen, do you have a solution? Well, I, normally I, I would be extremely concerned about proposing to do something on land you don't have any rights over. Oh, sure. However, it is the applicant's brother, and the applicant's brother has told me he has every intention of doing this. But to, to, so, no, and I understand that. Yeah. But to flip that around, if he grants the easement and this doesn't get approved, what happens then? That's why I, I'm thinking we can only see a proposed easement until the approval, and then the easement gets recorded at that point. Typically, what we could get is a proposed easement and a one-line letter from from the, the grantor that upon a planning board approval they plan on giving the right. easement. Right, exactly. It's just the, lang it's the specific language I'm more concerned about this at this point. Um, I walked in here tonight thinking there was an awful lot of stuff that wasn't complete in the application, and uh, it appears you're making a good faith effort to address that. Thank you for waiting two hours to do it, too, by the way. I'm still a little uncomfortable that we haven't had the benefit of the town engineer's comment because it was just pre presented to the board now. Um, I don't know that I'm personally qualified to evaluate it at all. I'd certainly like to have a chance, but I'd, you know, having the input, the peer review from the town engineer is critical for my evaluation of any application. Yeah. We actually spoke with the town engineer. I'm sorry. We actually spoke with the town engineer this afternoon. Um, my engineer spoke with Steve. Um, in Certainly, I just my telling you this, but Steve is not uncomfortable with foregoing the stormwater report where there is this small diameter um, culvert immediately above the large one we're putting in. But certainly, if um, you know the board feels comfortable with it, he had talked to us to start, and that's understandable. I'm curious as to why you're asking for a waiver for a maintenance agreement. Uh, no, we we aren't, are we? Well, I mean, it's, it's written into the the meets and bound. Um, it's going to be in the deed. deed. There's going to be a statement in the deed saying that Mr. Pillsbury is responsible for maintenance of the easement, not the Pillsburys or the town of Cape Elizabeth, and it is on the plan. So I, I don't believe we're asking for a waiver. I mean, it's even as I understand it. But Barbara, my understanding was that the town engineer suggested that they ask for a waiver on that because of the fact that it's it's in the deed. That's fine, that I, as long as there's some money? kind of agreement. It's, all, it's also my understanding that uh, the applicant's the only one who's going to use it. So it's right. not as if right. it would so right. just be him that would be responsible for maintaining it. I think the engineer suggested they asked for a waiver since it hadn't been submitted. Okay. But it's, but it's part of the deed that there it will be. It can be part of the deed, yeah, and that, that actually clears it up. Okay. Well, let, let me just ask, what's... What is your proposed time frame in terms of trying to uh, get going on this project? Uh, this, I mean, it's summer at the earliest. <clears throat> well, again, we're, the first issue we have to deal with is completeness. And uh, I, I know that there, there was a lot of information provided tonight that Mr. Charles correctly points out the town engineer hasn't had a chance to review. Uh, we haven't seen the language of the easement, although I agree with Maureen that I'm fairly confident that there, there will be an easement. Um, some of this really goes to approving the application as opposed to completeness, but uh, the board feels that uh, there still is information they would like to get to deem the application complete 
that that's fine. I guess my, my personal opinion is, given the information that's been provided tonight and the fact that, as I said before, the easement obviously is so critical that it, we can't approve it without it, um, I'd be willing to deem the application complete and, and, and move on, although the, the stormwater issue was one that, frankly, would be helpful to hear what the town engineer would have to say. Um, tell me about abutters. What, who is on the north side? Uh, the Sullivans are right here. Uh, my brother Graham and his wife Susan. My sister Lee and her husband Mike. Yep. Wilson. And are, are houses depicted on here or are they just not within the... No, the houses are considerably... Um, Solomon's house is well, it's over here. Graham's house is shown. The only one that's really very okay. close. And um, Lee and Mike are in the old Cape some distance from the property yep. line there. Yeah, I know. That house is, is pretty far away. And I might also point out that... Um, it's very flat in here, so it said it does drain this way. Um, there's no sign of any problems, any pooling, steaming water out here. This is a, it's a well pronounced ditch through here where the culvert's going to be going. And this is all drains directly into the pond that Graham excavated a couple of years ago. In terms of I just have a, a question for the applicant. I, I'm willing to deem this complete, though I just have some reservations about how we've kind of gotten this, and uh, I'm not trying to lay blame on anyone, but if we were to push you back a month, is that going to have, have a huge impact on your plans? In other words, if, if we ask you to come back next month on the completeness issue, I mean, if it were, that, that may cause some of the board members to just say, okay, well, I, I can't speak for anybody else, but it may cause me to say, okay, we'll just go forward and deem this complete. It, it's, I guess it's just that I've been working on this for you want to get it, it over like with about a year now, <laughs> and I mean until I get this, I can't really even think about the next step of selling our existing house, moving on to planning to build a new house and that type of thing. Um, it, it seems pretty clear what the applicant needs to move toward approval, yeah. and that's why I guess I'm having the same comfort level that John and David have identified, deeming complete, even though. Right. A big part of me says, it's not really. <laughs> because if those issues aren't resolved, the next, you know, the approval part's going to be a big problem. So whether you go down in flames on the completeness or in, on approval, we need that information. I guess I'm also real uncomfortable we just got these tonight. Uh, well, but yeah, I'm willing to move it forward given what uh, it is. This I, isn't a I big I apologize supplement. that we just received a letter from Mr. Harding a couple of days ago. Yeah. And and I, and I, I view what you all, you folks have done tonight is in, in good faith and you're making an right. effort here. So I, I'm, I'm willing to go forward and make a motion if, unless there's more discussion. Andy. I think, I think we're on the right track. I would, with the rest of the board's concurrence, suggest that we vote on completeness, presuming that that's approved. Uh, that we strongly encourage the applicant to work very closely with the town planner or the town engineer to resolve both completeness issues and any comments the town engineer may have about approval. Um, that we, my vote would be that we forego the need for a site walk. I think most of us have been through that area enough times to be familiar with it. That's up for discussion. But if we were to do that, we could schedule both a public hearing and a further discussion at our next meeting. I, I would just point out uh, in defense of the applicant that I noted that the letter from the town engineer is dated March 10th. When they may have received it, I don't know, but there wasn't a whole lot of time between reviewing that letter and seeing what was in there. And well, it came on, it was dated actually March 18th, the cover letter was. March the 18th. packet of information was sent on yeah, to, Oh, okay. Well, to, let's see. To, to be clear. That's um, today, isn't it? That's right. <laughs> to, to, to be clear, the, the process the board has does not provide an opportunity for an applicant to respond to comments that staff have provided for planning board meeting. You're supposed to use the time prior to the submission date to talk to staff and find out what you need. Once everything's submitted, um, all the effort goes into preparing a review for the board. And the letter from the town engineer and the memo from the planner are sent to the applicant solely as a courtesy so that they have the same thing in front of them as, as the planning board members. There's never been any intention of 
having an opportunity to respond to the town engineer's letter after it's been drafted. Well, in this case, it did it did serve to move things along a little bit to, to respond because, frankly, had this not arrived tonight, I, I don't think we could have deemed the application complete. Uh, so, do we have a motion? Anyone? David? I'm happy to make a motion. You're very good at it. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I can read this one correctly today. Uh, a motion for the board to consider. Uh, a motion for completeness. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented the application of Marshall and Suzanne Pillsbury for a private access way permit and a resource protection permit for a driveway to access a lot located at 78 Two Lights Road be deemed complete. Is there a second? Mr. Chairman, I would like to second the motion. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Okay, all in favor of the motion? And that is unanimous. So the application is deemed complete. Um, I tend to agree with Andy on the issue of the site walk. Um, I don't know if anyone here feels strongly that we need to go look at this property. I'm fairly familiar with it. Uh, but I would certainly be open to those on the board that feel otherwise and think we should schedule a site walk, and if that's the case, we should do that. Now, does anyone feel that that's necessary? I'll try. Okay. Um, what, what I would suggest is uh, at this point, and again, I'd be curious here with the board, the rest of the board would say that, that we table the application to the next meeting. At that point, you can address all of the open issues, and then we'll discuss approval. Um, and hopefully, if everyone, all your ducks in a row, you can get it approved um, at the next meeting. Uh, we probably will have, I guess, a public hearing to be safe. But we can do that and also uh, approve the same the same night. Uh, I don't know if anyone has any other thoughts. I think that makes sense. Uh, I, I can't. I don't imagine we're going to get a whole lot of uh, input from the public on this one. So I think we could move this. Well, if his, his brother shows up and says yeah. he doesn't like it, <laughs> <laughs> that <laughs> might that might mean something. <laughs> It's his brother's fault there was no access in the first place. <laughs> he was in such a hurry to get his block done, we couldn't decide where to put the road 10 years ago. That's why I'm just predicting right now. Um, so, do we have a motion? Andy. Motion for public hearing. Be it ordered that the above plan be tabled to the regular April 15, 2003 meeting of the Planning Board, at which time a public hearing shall be held. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor? unanimous and I again would urge you to stay in touch with Maureen and uh, make sure that we have everything for the next meeting and if you do you should be able to move on Very good. thank you thank you I move that we adjourn we have a motion to adjourn uh -huh. way to third that motion <laughs> all in favor Aye. all right Thank you.